Good afternoon, everybody. It's great to see such a uh, healthy crowd out on a beautiful Austin afternoon. Uh, my name is Will Inboden. I'm the executive director of the Clement Center for History, Strategy, and Statecraft here at UT, and we are your we are your host host for the day. Uh, but I want to emphasize that while the Clement Center is the sponsor of the event, uh, we've got a broad range of co-sponsors. I want to acknowledge. I think uh, this uh, this coming together, this group really shows the tremendous interest in thoughtful conversation on foreign policy uh, here here at UT. So our co-sponsors include the LBJ School of Public Affairs, the Strauss Center for International Security and Law, the, the LBJ Future Forum, the College Republicans of Texas, the Hamilton Society, the Goldwater Society, the Federalist Society, AEI on campus. I'm only about a tenth of the way through. So anyway, uh, the AEI Enterprise Club, the Chicano and Hispanic Law Student Association, the Hispanic Leadership Initiative, and the Texas Politics Project. And I want to mention those groups uh, partly because it was uh, because of their their support that we're able to get such a great gathering today, but also because I like I said I think that really represents um, uh, so much of the interest that Senator Rubio has has captured uh, in his in his years in the Senate, uh, particularly as he has been speaking out more and more in foreign policy. So uh, it's now. Now my honor to introduce uh, my my dear friend George C, who is the chairman of Annandale Capital in Dallas, um, a uh, loyal Longhorn alum with two degrees from here. But most importantly, for our purposes, he's the chairman of the board for the Clement Center. And so George is going to uh, come out and say a welcome, and then introduce our speaker. So. Thank you. Hook them. Um, Great to be with you all here today. Uh, Bill Clements, 40 years ago, who's the namesake of this center, that let us never send the President of the United States to the negotiating table as head of the second strongest country in the world. And thanks to the leadership we've had in this country over the last several decades, we've never had to do that. But in the 70s, when he said those words, we got pretty close. And in the, it's in that spirit that we welcome Senator Marco Rubio here today. Senator Rubio is a friend of many years of mine. And he has taken a very keen interest in foreign policy, intelligence, national security, and the strength of this country. And in uh, keeping with Reagan-esque foreign policy where American power should be projected, but from a strategic viewpoint, from a Pax Americana viewpoint, where we preserve the world peace, uh, where projection of US power is something that is not taken lightly and not done without a whole lot of careful thought. He is really a leading voice in foreign policy with only a few years in the United States Senate. He's become a leader immediately. And um, we are so pleased to have him here in Texas today. It's, uh, it's nice to have a voice that, that is not moving us towards isolation, toward withdrawal from world affairs, but strategic engagement for United States uh, national security interests. And also with what we've seen in Crimea, in Ukraine, in Libya, and in other spots around the world, it, it's imperative that we stay focused on what we're doing outside of the United States, as well as all the critical elements of domestic policy we need to pay attention to as well. So without further delay, it's my privilege to introduce my friend, United States Senator Marco Rubio. Please give him a warm welcome. <laughs> Glad to have you here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. I, uh, I didn't bring the teleprompter, so I thought I'd just uh, speak about some things that are on my mind. But uh, no, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. It's great to be in Texas, great to be in Austin, and great to be with all of you to talk about a topic that I don't get asked about enough. Uh, people don't want to talk about this as much, although lately, I think because of events in the news, there's more and more discussion about national security and its link to prosperity. And so what I wanted to do for a few moments is speak to you before a question and answer about both my interests in public uh, and foreign affairs and where we are as a nation heading into the 21st century as we are in now the early stages of the 21st century and what it means. Uh, let me start by a proposition that perhaps those of you, so many students that are here and others who study both history and international politics, I think would agree with. And that is that if you look at the course of human history, thousands of years of recorded history, what we know to be the affairs of man, Security and prosperity have not been the natural order of things. In fact, the story of humanity has been the story of conflict, often armed and bloody and disruptive. In just the last century, twice this nation and the world were thrown into deep global conflicts in World War I and World War II. And, of course, we lived through the Cold War and Korea, Vietnam, 
and some other engagements. But an interesting thing happened after the end of World War II. America emerged unquestionably as the most powerful nation on the earth, and it used that power and that influence to set up guidelines for international conduct. From the lessons learned in World War II, we tried to put in place, along with freedom-loving people everywhere, norms for international relationships between nations and people in the hopes of never again having a conflict like the Second World War or the First World War before it. And the results were unquestionably positive. It wasn't an era without any sort of conflict. Certainly, we lived through a Cold War in which the Soviet Union and the United States came close on a couple of occasions to catastrophe. But by and large, it was an era of extraordinary spread of democracy and freedom, and more importantly, of, of prosperity all over the world. In fact, if we look back now at the end of World War II to where we stand today, two of the most prosperous nations on Earth were the nations that lost that war in Germany and in Japan. Nations like South Korea that emerged divided during the Cold War were not so long ago donor states. I'm sorry, were recipient states of aid and now have become donor states. In essence, the story of the 20th century, though not perfect, is the story of prosperity, of the spread of democracy and stability around the world. All of it the result of American leadership. Not America by itself. We certainly had participants who worked alongside us to make this possible. But since the end of the Second World War, America has been the only nation with both the economy and the military power, and therefore the international heft, to pull together this international order and to help maintain it as the leader of the free world and a free people throughout. It wasn't a period without challenge, and on a number of occasions, we certainly had to examine ourselves and what we wanted to stand for in order to ensure that we confronted the challenges of our time. But as we look back at that era, it is unquestionably an American century, not just because of the example we set here at home, but because of the difference our leadership made around the world. So my point is that especially since the, end, since the beginning of that era, but especially from the period that ended the Cold War until perhaps the attacks of 9-11, the world we knew was largely a peaceful and prosperous, was, a prosperous one. Certainly there were conflicts and humanitarian crisis and, and horrible crimes committed against humanity in parts of the world, but by and large the world was able to avoid wide-scale conflict. And it was an era where the multipolar world ended, and in fact the United States stood unquestionably once again as the only superpower on the globe. But beginning on that September day in 2001, the world began to change, and I argue, began to go back to a sort of normal state of affairs if you look at it from the purpose of human, from the aspect of human history. And now as we enter this second decade of the 21st century, that pace towards that trend has only accelerated. Now I'm gonna to describe to you the world as we wish it were. A world where every country and every leader on the world was committed to peace, where we respected one another, where nations that had disagreements could negotiate them at international forums and work their way through where all disputes could be resolved by talking rather than by conflict, where every nation was committed to the freedom and the dignity of all human beings. This is the world we wish it were. This is the world as we wish it were. This is the, goal, this is the world that we aspire to one day see. But still, it is not the world as it is. And every single day we are reminded of that now across the planet. The world as it is is a world where in China, a government systematically violates the rights of his own people, the human rights of their own people, but in addition has now expanded its territorial claims in the region. It claims that islands and rock formations and other uh, territories in the region rightfully belong to them, and they cite historical evidence from thousands of years ago to back up their claim. But they're not just saying these words anymore. These claims have always been there. They have now increased their military capacity significantly to the point where they are on pace to become a dominant military power in the region and perhaps begin to act on some of these claims. The fear is that at some point, the price of confronting China in any sort of conflict in the region will be so high that the, neighbor, that the countries of the region will recognize the United States will be unwilling or incapable of standing up to the security guarantees that we've made to our partners and allies in the region. And as a result, these nations will be forced to accept new terms in terms of not just territorial integrity, but their own sovereignty and their relationship to China and the world. We look to Europe, where at some point in the last few years, Vladimir Putin has made a decision that his relationship with America and the West is a zero-sum game. 
where either he wins or we do. He has walked away from the idea that somehow we can both benefit. And despite our frequent urgings by multiple presidents and America at large, he has discarded that view and has made up his mind that the only way he can succeed and restore Russia to the great power status he wants it to be is if somehow we are diminished and the West is diminished. You see him acting on this belief. In Eastern Europe, he has seen it as necessary to invade Crimea and potentially right now, Ukraine. In fact, not potentially, in fact, they are now involved in a similar operation to what you saw in Crimea. As Russian agent, agents cross the border to agitate, to provoke, in the hopes of creating the stage for then intermilitary intervention and to delegitimize the government in Kiev. Beyond it, there all the, you saw that just a few years ago, he took the exact same action in a much more overt way in Georgia. And multiple nations in Eastern Europe now feel threatened by Russian expansionism, by the rhetoric that's coming from, what, from, from Moscow. Which by the way, internally in Russia, we've seen nationalism and outrageous speech that we didn't see even in the Soviet era begin to grow. It is a daunting precedent. You move further south into the Middle East and you find extraordinarily challenge, extraordinary challenges there as well. The Syrian conflict has become a proxy war between Iran, Russia, and Assad on the one side and everybody else on the other. And tragically, in addition to that, vast ungoverned spaces have opened up in Syria where the government doesn't control the territory. And it increasingly has become the premier operational space on the planet for radical jihadists to train and operate from. I will make a prediction to you tonight that if things continue the way they are, soon we will see attacks staged against our interests and God forbid perhaps even our homeland from those ungoverned spaces in Syria. Beyond that, we see Iran's nuclear ambitions destabilizing the region as well. As Iran aspires towards a nuclear weapon, other nations are prepared to take steps to match them. And I am convinced that a nuclear Iran will quickly be followed by a nuclear Saudi Arabia, and one day potentially a nuclear Turkey as well. Our strongest alliances in the region feel threatened. The Jordanians' extraordinary partners in safety and security feel threatened every single day, not just by a million or more refugees that have crossed the, across the border and placed tremendous strains on their budget, but by the, the existence of radicals just north of their border that threaten to come into Jordan and one day overthrow that government. And of course, Israel is insecure as they've been in a very long time. Everywhere they look, they see insecurity. Syria is insecure. Egypt is going through extraordinary transition. Their relationships with the Turks have significantly degraded. And oftentimes from Washington, they feel like some of the rhetoric creates space between us and them that invites either more, even more aggression on the part of their enemies, not to mention an international effort to delegitimize Israel's right to exist. In Latin America, an area that often gets neglected, not by me because I live so close to it, and not by you because you care about our region, but by many policymakers, there is troubling trends as well. Cuba has long been a dictatorship, but now throughout Latin America, we are seeing the spread of totalitarianism disguised as democracy. You see, simply having an election alone does not make you a democracy. You have to govern as Democrats. You have to have freedom of the press, freedom of religion, freedom of expression. You have to have free and fair elections. And in nation after nation, this is eroding. It's already eroded in Nicaragua and in Venezuela, in Ecuador and in Bolivia. It threatens now to erode in places like Panama and Argentina. And these hard fought gains in democracy and in progress in the region now seem like perhaps they're beginning to slip away. There are other parts of the world that I can point to as sources of conflict. But the bottom line is that all over the world, we are beginning to see the reemergence of a battle, an ideological, a spiritual battle between the forces of tyranny and the forces of freedom. This is perhaps simplistic language to some, but it is truly what it is. For I ask you, what democracy on the planet is creating conflict with their neighbors? Every single flashpoint on earth every single conflict on this planet, in every place where people are suffering and dying and being invaded and imprisoned and persecuted. It is a tyranny that stands behind that action. In Asia, it is China and North Korea that create instability. In Europe, it is Russia. In the Middle East, it is the Iranians and radical jihadists. In Latin America, it's the Castros and Chavez and now Maduro and Ortega and Nicaragua.
It isn't Switzerland. It isn't Ireland or the United Kingdom. It isn't the freedom-loving people of the world. It's the tyrannical governments that are setting the stage for this. And so what is the choice before us? Well, there seems to be two schools of thought. One school of thought in American politics, shared by some on both the left and right, is that what we need to do now is further disengage. That the time has come for America to take a step back from the global stage and allow our allies and other nations on the planet to take a greater role. And I would say to you that ideally that would be fantastic. I would love to see NATO reinvigorated with the NATO governments of Europe spending more money in their national defense. I would love to see the democracies of Latin America rally to the cause of freedom and democracy in other nations. In an ideal world, this is exactly what would happen. But as I told you a moment ago, we don't live in the ideal world. Those of us who make policy must live in the real world. And in the real world, there is only one nation on this planet still capable of rallying the free people of this world to the great causes of our time. And that nation is ours. That is not my opinion. That is a matter of fact that is stated to me every time that I travel abroad. In fact, the number one question I get when I was at the United Kingdom, or when I was in Japan, or Korea, or the Philippines, or anywhere else, the number one question I get it, will America still be engaged? Will they still be our partner, not just in our mutual defenses, but in our economic progress? Can we still count on American leadership? Or have you reached a point in your history where your people are no longer willing to do this? Because they're so focused on what's happening at home that they forget what's happening abroad impacts what's happening at home as well. In fact, that truism has never been more true. The world is more in interconnected than it's ever been. Never before have we seen events halfway around the world have as much impact on things that are happening right here, right now. In fact, I would venture to guess that for many of you who are in business and commerce, events that are happening halfway around the world sometimes have a greater impact on your bottom line than events happening halfway across town. This is the world that we live in. And perhaps because I and many of you grew up in a generation that was raised after Vietnam, at the tail end of the Cold War, in a, unipolar world, in a unipolar world where the United States was the only power on it, perhaps the temptation exists to grow complacent, to believe that all we have and all we see in the world we know today was simply the way things, the way things always were, that this is the normal and natural state of affairs. It's easy to believe that when you grow up in an era of unquestioned prosperity, in an era where democracy was growing and there were few challenges to our leadership. But those who have been around longer and those who have taken the time to study the true lessons of history understand that that has never been the case. And it will not be the case now. Twice in the last century, this nation paid an extraordinary price for ignoring the events around us. And what happens with these problems around the world is they eventually come for us. There is no serious problem on this planet that will stay where it is. We can ignore our enemies, we can ignore our adversaries, we can ignore those who wish us ill, but I promise you they will not ignore us. In fact, I promise you that they aren't ignoring us right now. That there are nations on earth that we hardly talk about, whose number one priority is to diminish America's power and influence on the planet, and by consequence of that, diminish our way of life as well. There are organizations on this planet whose number one organizing principle it's to strike at the heart of our way of life, of our freedoms, at our prosperity, and at our example. And I hope this is a lesson that we don't have to be reminded of through another tragic, through another tragic incident, or perhaps even through a conflict. For we still have time to realize the world for what it truly is, to take heed from the lessons that history has taught us, and to do something about it. And what is it that we need to do about it? I think three key critical things. The first is we must never forget the fundamental truth that the best way to ensure peace is through strength. That the best way to avoid war, to avoid war is to have a military that any other potential adversary in the world knows if they go up against them, they will lose. America, if you want peace and prosperity, one of the best ways to ensure it is to have a military advantage that no one will question and no one will dare try. The second is we must be engaged diplomatically everywhere in the world. 
We must speak out on the causes of human rights. And that includes not just violations of democracy, but systemic violations against women and children and the poor and the defenseless, violations of religious liberties. In this world today, there are people sitting in jails for, because they converted to Christianity. There are women that are forced to have abortions. We should never stand by and see these as legitimate practices of another culture, not in the 21st century, not on our watch. I hope that when people look back at our time here, they will say that this generation of Americans were a clear voice against these abuses, whether they were committed by friendly governments or hostile ones. We should never stand by with our arms crossed and watch the rights of other people violated without saying a word. And by the way, when we speak on these issues, the world cares. And last but not least, we must lead by our own example by putting in place policies that rescue the important programs that, under, that underpin our economy. Programs like Social Security and Medicare, whose runaway costs are forcing us each and every day to make draconian cuts on our military expenditures and therefore our military capabilities. By turning our economy around, by embracing the principles of free enterprise that prove to the world what a free people can do when given the opportunity to turn their ideas into a business or to a product. It is through the strength of our military, the engagement of our diplomatic voice, and our example as the world's leading economy, that we can ensure that peace and prosperity spreads in the 21st century instead of erodes. This is an extraordinary challenge before us, but a necessary one, not a unique one. In fact, every generation before us has had a similar challenge. Your great-grandparents' generation fought in the First World War if they lived here. It was a time of extraordinary struggle. Your grandparents' generation endured the Second World War and Korea and much of the Cold War, a time of extraordinary loss of life and global instability. Your parents, and maybe some of you, lived through the Vietnam era, a troubling time for our nation when thousands of our young men and some women returned from service abroad in caskets covered by our flag. And even now, over the last decade, we've seen Americans pay a terrible price in order to confront terrorism and tyranny around the world. Now it is our time to confront the nature of our new challenges. And the choice couldn't be clearer. It is a choice between two very different futures. One is a future where America is diminished, where our, vo where our voice is silenced, where we exit more and more from the stage, and a void is left behind. A void that will be filled by governments and leaders that do not share your principles, do not share your values, and care little for the rights of their own people, much less the rights of others. If left unchallenged, history teaches us that eventually they will come for us too in some form or fashion. The other choice is another American century. Not an era where we dominate the world, but surely one where we lead it through our example through our economic growth and prosperity, through the way we treat our own people. We inspire others to want that for themselves. That other nations will look to us and say, we want the freedoms and prosperities that they have in America. And that's what we will aspire to create here in our own country, in our own unique way. A century in which it will be easier than ever to do business with people halfway around the world. A century where your customers can come from anywhere where instead of having to only sell to other Americans, you will be able to sell to a growing middle class of millions of people that live everywhere. People that can be your investors and your partners. They can buy the services and goods that you provide. They can travel here as tourists. They can study at our universities. This is the opportunity of the 21st century, but it is one that must be seized. It will not happen on its own. It will require us to do what every generation before us has done, to be real to be really understand what is before us and embrace it, not just a challenge, as a challenge, but as an opportunity. So that when our time here is done, we can turn to the next generation and say, we left for you something better than what was left for us. What we inherited was the greatest nation of the 20th century. And what we will leave for you is the greatest nation of the 21st. And because we do, our children, our grandchildren, and many of us can go down in history as the freest, and the most prosperous generation of Americans that have ever lived. That must be our goal in this century, and it is achievable. But we must remember that in order to do it, we must embrace the greatness of our past.
to lead us to an even more greatness in our future. So thank you for the opportunity to speak to you about these things. I look forward to discussing it more. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. To follow up on those uh, fascinating and uh, really stimulating remarks, uh, Senator Rubio has agreed to have a little conversation here with me, uh, inter interview, interview style. So, uh, Senator, one theme I was struck by in your remarks just now and then our conversation outside is uh, frequent references to history. And of course, history is one of the animating themes of the Clements Center here. We want to draw on the insights of history for contemporary uh, uh, national security policy and challenges. Are there any uh, either historical eras or historical figures that have been especially influential in forming your worldview and your, your approach to foreign policy? Sure. I mean, so there are a number. I think if you look back, for example, at the, at the, during the, the period of World War II, um, Winston Churchill, I think, provides extraordinary guidance for Americans today. Uh, he had a resolute belief in how you needed to confront and defeat tyranny at that time on the European continent. And but for his extraordinary leadership, uh, it's hard to imagine what could have happened to Britain uh, during World War II, a country that, quite frankly, had made some strategic mistakes leading up to it. They so desperately wanted peace that it came at the expense of their security and uh, created precedents that I think to this day provide um, strong historical truths for us that we should be guided by. I certainly have tremendous admiration for Ronald Reagan, and my admiration for Ronald Reagan is twofold. One, I, I think we need to be reminded that in the end of the 1970s, there was a prevailing school of thought among some in the media, many observers, including in academia, that we needed to accept a new order in which the Soviet Union wasn't just our equal, but in fact perhaps maybe had been destined to become superior to us. Uh, you saw uh, as uh, it looked like communism, Marxism could be spreading even into our own hemisphere beyond Cuba. Reagan never accepted that. And not only did he never accept it, he confronted it. In fact, Reagan had the audacity consistently throughout his career in public service to predict that communism was doomed to failure. And uh, when, people, when he used to say that, by the way, people used to laugh. I mean, the, the world people knew was one in which these two superpowers were equally uh, positioned and that... They perhaps were destined to one day go to war unless this rhetoric was toned down. Now, it is true, Reagan negotiated with the Soviets, and that was the pragmatic thing to do, but he never accepted what they stood for. He never accepted communism, Marxism, and all of its elements as a legitimate way to govern. And I think that's also an important lesson for us. You know, we will have to negotiate and interact, for example, with the government in China and even the government in Russia, but we should never accept what they stand for as legitimate. We should never accept that what they, what, how they treat their people and others is legitimate. And I think that's critically important in this new century that those lessons be applied. Obviously, there are unique challenges in the 21st century that are different from anything we've ever seen. But there are fundamental truths about human nature that you find embedded time and again in the historical record. And it would not be wise to ignore that. We cannot afford, especially in the realm of foreign policy, to be uh, operating in, in, in theory or in wishful thinking. It has to be deep, deeply rooted in reality and in what the world is, not in what we wish the world was. Well, if I can uh, follow, uh, follow up on that, because uh, particularly when you were given your tour to horizon during your, during your remarks, it was kind of a you know, grim and sobering assessment, I think a realistic one of the state of the world today, uh, whether uh, resurgent uh, jihadist groups in Syria, um, continuing mischief making by China and North Korea, et cetera. And yet there's a criticism, some might even call it a caricature, uh, among some voices calling for America to pull back from the world. That anytime you highlight those challenges, that you're implicitly suggesting we need a military solution. In the wake of Iraq and Afghanistan, anytime someone talks about the problems in Syria or with North Korea or with Russia, uh, that there's a call for a military solution. Uh, can you talk about what, what do you think the tools of diplomacy and uh, economic instruments of statecraft, what role do those have in American leadership in the world? Um, well, I mean, let's not ignore military capability. Yeah. I mean, the truth is that every country gets a vote at the United Nation. The reason why ours matters more than other countries is because we have the world's finest and most capable military. Mm -hmm. uh, so we shouldn't ignore that. Uh, we don't, shouldn't say that lightly either. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the toughest parts of my job in the three years I've been in the Senate are the letters of condolences that I sign almost weekly now mm -hmm. to a family that's lost a, lo that lost a loved one, a brother, a sister, a husband, a father, a son, or a daughter. Uh, abroad, and it's a heartbreaking and heart-wrenching note to sign, and you can just imagine what these families are going through, so we don't take that lightly. Uh, 
By the same token, I do think that military power is a, is a valid tool of statecraft, primarily because the stronger you are, the less likely you are to have to use it. And I think that's critically important throughout the world, and no region more important than in Asia, mm -hmm. where many countries there now feel potentially threatened in the short to midterm by Chinese expansionism. Uh, the Philippines is first and foremost. The Chinese have made claims on the Scarborough Shoal and other places, and, uh, and the Filipinos feel deeply threatened by it. But you're also starting to see that feeling creep into Japan. In fact, not creep in, it's been significant with the Japanese and even among the South Koreans. So I think it's important for us to have the capability because the stronger we are in our security assurances in this part of the world and another, the less likely that these countries will decide that they need a nuclear weapon or that they need to somehow increase their own military capability to the point where perhaps it could lead to miscalculation and an escalation. But beyond that, I would say that we need to be engaged and we need to care. Ukraine is a perfect example. Uh, I think it's crystal clear at this point that what's happening in eastern Ukraine is quite similar to what happened in Crimea. You have these mysterious individuals showing up in unmarked uniforms with distinct Russian ac accents who are taking over buildings and asserting themselves. I don't think these people came from nowhere. I think that's part of a directed effort by Russia to create instability in eastern Ukraine and perhaps the conditions to then go in militarily under the guise of protecting the Russian-speaking population. I think that's crystally and abundantly clear. And I don't know why it's taken current policymakers so long to say we're going to impose additional sanctions, continue to isolate Russia diplomatically and economically, but also potentially prepare or begin to prepare Crimea, I'm sorry, Ukraine for its own defense by providing them the training and the weapons they need to protect the sovereignty of their country. And I think the time has come for that sort of thing. So that's another uh, state of tool, uh, tool of statecraft that we have. The last is are both our example and our voice. You would be surprised as I travel around the world how many people want us to just speak out about what's going on. They want, the, it gives them comfort, but it also assurances and attention when America lines itself up firmly on the side of those who are fighting for liberty and freedoms. I've been quite disturbed at how the American press corps and most American politicians in Washington have completely ignored what's happening in Venezuela. In Venezuela, you have young people taken to the streets, primarily because the government is incompetent, but also because freedom has eroded there. And I've expressed myself strongly on the side of those demonstrators who all they want is a free and prosperous country. And our official response is much more cautious. And that sends a message that we just don't care that we're not engaged. I think that has long-term implications for foreign policy as well. Yeah. So if I can follow up on this theme of, of speaking out, one issue that you've spoken out on quite a bit, you referenced in your remarks uh, earlier, is international religious freedom. Um, why, why should international religious freedom matter to American foreign policy? Well, first, because we, we, if you look at the founding documents of our nation, it says that all people are created equal with certain unalienable rights to life, to liberty, and to pursue happiness. It doesn't say all people born in North America. It doesn't say all people born in the continental United States. It says all people. We believe that as a defining principle of our country. And as a result, if we believe these principles, we have to live them. And to live them means to speak on behalf of those uh, who we believe whose rights are being violated. So if you look around the world today, it's not just religious liberties. There are there countries in the world where women aren't allowed to drive. Are we supposed to say, well, that's just their culture. We should accept it. I don't think that we should ever be on the side of saying that. I also don't think we should invade you because you don't let women drive. But by the same token, we shouldn't stand by and say, well, that's just a normal way of being over there. It's not a normal way of being. It's not, and we should never accept that as normal. Nor should we accept that it is normal to put someone in jail because they're a Christian missionary. Nor should we accept it's normal that Tibetans are, 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 are persecuted by the Chinese government. Nor should we accept it's normal that these things are happening as a matter of course all over the world. That Christians are targeted for uh, these trumped up charges of blasphemy in Pakistan. That, that Jews all over the world are persecuted, that there's an all-out international effort to delegitimize the right of a Jewish state. We should never accept these things as normal or acceptable. And, and, and that includes, and, and where it becomes difficult is when these violations are occurring on the part of governments which largely are cooperative with us in geopolitical issues. Uh, I think that calls us, uh, puts us in a, in a more delicate situation, but one that we should be unequivocal about as well. I think it is critical because otherwise, if that's not the case, if we are not going to speak for these principles, then all we are to other people around the world is just another superpower, another geopolitical power interested only in what's good for their country without any interest to what's good for others. And, and, and by the way, I would make my last point. Countries in which there isn't that sort of discrimination, countries in which people are not persecuted in this way, these countries end up being more peaceful, more prosperous, and less, 
less engaged in creating conflict and division. Great, it's kind of a sort of holistic cycle of uh, virtue and prosperity that goes together. So a few specific issues uh, we might want to cover. Um, one is, given your membership on the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, uh, I'm just curious, what's your assessment of how severe is the damage from the Edward Snowden revelations? The single uh, most damaging um, revelation of American secrets in our history. Um, I can say to you unequivocally that there are Americans whose lives are at risk because of these disclosures. I can say to you unequivocally that there are things around the world that make us safer, that are endangered because of these revelations. And I would say to you that if this individual truly believed that he saw a wrongdoing, he should have reported it up the chain of command or, and I'm not saying this would be right, but at a minimum, limit his disclosures to the programs that he had concerns about. Instead, it's been this massive uh, revelation of all sorts of information about the way we operate to keep Americans safe. Uh, delivered to potential adversaries, both the Russians and potentially the Chinese, done in the most uh, uh, damaging way possible, and sprinkled with a bunch of lies, mm -hmm. things that just fundamentally are not true. Yeah. Um, and I've heard some American political voices say this, that if you have a cell phone, you're being monitored. That is categorically false. Mm -hmm. If I believe that to be true, I wouldn't stand with my arms crossed and say, oh, that's okay, that's acceptable. That is categorically false. Mm -hmm. That is just not true. And to say that undermines our ability to gather intelligence. Meanwhile, let there be no doubt, and I hate to say this, but it is absolutely true, let there be no doubt that even as I speak to you today, capable and well-funded elements on the planet are plotting to attack Americans here and around the world. That is a fact. That is not a theory. That is not something I think. That is a fundamental truth. And I promise you that if God forbid that were to occur, the first question people are going to ask is, why didn't we know about it and why couldn't we have stopped it? And the voices that are trying to undermine these programs will have to answer that question. And so I, I do think we have to protect our civil liberties. I do think that as Americans, we have expectations of privacy that should always be respected. But by the same token, I think the number one obligation of the national federal government is to protect our national security and our safety. And, and nothing is more important in my mind than that. Without that safety and security, our civil liberties are impossible to exercise. And we are under threat, unlike ever before in the cyber realm, which is another growing threat that no one talks about enough. But you don't have to have nuclear weapons anymore to hurt a country badly. We've already seen, just in some of the commercial breaches, how a small non-state actor can gain access to valuable commercial information. Well, imagine if you wake up one day to the news that your bank account has been cleaned out by a cyber actor abroad who gained access to our financial markets and not only wiped you out, but wiped millions of Americans out. Think of the panic that would ensue. This is the world that we live in today. These are real threats, and we need to confront them with the seriousness they deserve. I would uh, note that on the Snowden case, we're also honored to have with us today Admiral Bob Inman here in the front row, the former head of the National Security Agency, who's had a uh, similarly grim assessment about the damage from the Snowden fallout. So, Admiral, thank you. Um, uh, Senator, following up on uh, what you're uh, talking just now about the cyber threat, uh, global internet freedom has also emerged as a 21st century issue. It's not something we even talked about or had vocabulary for in, in the 20th century. Uh, and, uh, you know, technology can, it seems, you know, really be a two-edged sword, obviously a source of new, new uh, threats and perils, but also of new opportunities. Uh, so especially in light of the um, recent uh, news about USAID's uh, you know, Twitter program in, in Cuba and the continued firewall the Cuban government is put up against any sort of uh, free expression there. What's your, what are your observations on the, the role of technology in global politics today? I think the ro ro role of technology uh, has the promise of fundamentally transforming the world. You've already seen uh, the leading edges of that. And for example, the so-called Arab Spring was largely led by um, online efforts uh, through social media. The unrest in Venezuela, the protests in Venezuela are organized in that way. What I've said about Cuba is I don't, if, I, if the internet were to open up and become available for every Cuban, the Castro regime couldn't survive more than a year with people able to talk to each other and read any newspaper in the world that they want. I believe internet freedom is, is critical, not just for political speech, however. I think internet freedom is, is critical because it's literally removed the barriers to entry economically. Today, we now live in a world where you can start a business using the free Wi-Fi at a Starbucks. There are people that now operate their business completely in the digital realm. If you've seen it, the explosion of innovation and economic growth that has happened around the world, uh, the digital realm and the internet has made that possible. Uh, 
And so protecting its freedom and its open access is critical not just to our liberal, civil liberties and our political liberties, it's also critical to our economic abil uh, liberties as well. And we would, be, it, we would be silly to ignore that there are dozens of countries around the world that now restrict access to the internet, from Turkey to Cuba to Venezuela to North Korea to Russia and to China. These are countries that deliberately tried to limit access to the internet because they don't want people to have, be able to talk to each other, because they don't want people to be able to get news from anywhere that they choose to. America should always be firmly on the side of internet freedom, and we can actually do something about it uh, because of the, the amount of influence that we have over the multi-stakeholder process that governs the internet. And I think we should be very cautious about turning that over to any forum that could potentially become controlled by governments that choose to deny access and freedom of expression on the internet. There seem to be some moves in that direction recently. Uh, well, I think the moves in the direction you've seen recently, in and of themselves, are not a bad idea, having a multi-stakeholder system that involves more international partners. I think what's a mistake is to rush into it yeah. in some predetermined, preordained way. I think we need to clearly understand what that new multi-stakeholder process will look like before we make that move. And I would say, given recent events around the world, we should be cautious about how quickly we move on something like that. Let's uh, shift now to Iran. Um, the clock is ticking on the six-month interim agreement we have that the Obama administration brokered with Iran. The clock is also ticking on the Iranian nuclear program. Uh, what should the U.S. do about Iran's nuclear program going forward? Um, and if I can ask even more specifically, if diplomacy and economic sanctions fail, would you support the use of force? On the second point, the, the answer is yes. Uh, I think it's that serious of a threat. But in order to understand Iran, let's take a step back and understand it from their viewpoint. This is, in my, it's not my opinion, it's what I know to be fact. The Iranians have entered these negotiations because international sanctions have badly hurt their economy. By the way, despite these crippling international sanctions, Iran continues to spend millions of dollars a year supporting terrorism all over the world, all over the world, including in our own hemisphere, despite these sanctions. So what does Iran want? Iran, the mandate they've set to their negotiators is quite straightforward. Go out and get these sanctions lifted but do not give up and do not make any concessions that are irreversible. In essence, we want to keep in place our enrichment and our reprocessing capabilities because at some point in the future, we want the option to ramp them up. Once the world's become distracted, once people are worried about something else, once America's gotten weaker, if we can get these sanctions lifted, how they view the world is if they could get these sanctions lifted, they now can grow their economy, which stabilizes them internally, they can use more of this money to increase their asymmetrical capabilities to help these sort of terrorist activities around the world. And once they've established themselves as an asymmetrical power that can threaten our interests through cyber attacks or by blowing up our embassies or by doing acts of terrorism through surrogates against our allies, once they've established that leverage, then they can go back to the world and say, well, if you want all that stuff to stop, then you have to let us even further expand our nuclear programs. That, I think, is their long-term goal. We would be silly not to see it that way. So our, we must do everything we can to prevent Iran from becoming a nuclear weapons power. And that includes, if all else fails, taking military action to prevent them from doing so. But I think the most effective way to ensure that that happens is to maintain and place these sanctions. I wish, I really do, with all my heart, that I could believe that these negotiations that are going on in Geneva would, would, would produce an Iran that would say, we're going to prove to the world we're not interested in weapons. We're going to give up our enrichment and reprocessing capabilities. We're going to do it the way most of the other nuclear energy powers do it. We're going to import the enriched uranium, and we're going to, use, we're going to import only the, what we need and only at the levels that we need for medical uses and for energy. But that's not what they're going to do. What they want to maintain, and what tragically this administration has already committed, is allowing them the right to enrich and to reprocess. And once you have that capability, you're just a step removed from ramping that up anytime you choose to do so in the future. Uh, so, so I think that we should be very clear, and that we should not weaken what's already in place through the United Nations, which calls not just for the end of re reprocessing and enrichment, it calls for the end of their sponsorship of terrorism. It calls for the end of their ballistic missiles program. And we're now somehow going to agree to something that's weaker than that. And I, I think that would be a, 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 I think we're going to pay a terrible price for that long term. Thanks. All right. Well, now I'd, I'd like to turn it over. We have a few students here who have some uh, questions I'd like to put to Senator Rubio as well. So uh, Captain Archuleta, can we call on you first? This is uh, Captain Brandon Archuleta, U.S. Army uh, veteran of Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, a Ph.D. student here who will soon be returning to West Point as an instructor. So. Thank you for the, uh, the introduction, <laughs> Professor Bowden. Senator Rubio, thank you so much for being here, sir. Uh, 
having a, an understanding of your vision for American Grand Strategy was terrific. Uh, the way you view the instruments of uh, national power, particularly diplomacy, the military, intelligence, and economics. But I wonder what role in your vision, sir, is there for international institutions, particularly uh, the UN, NATO, uh, the World Bank, IMF. How do we leverage those institutions uh, to guarantee peace and prosperity across the world? And uh, perhaps a bit more pessimistically, sir, are they still relevant? Are they necessary uh, as they were in the post-World War II era? Well, I think that's a great question. I think these, um, these are all potential forums for international action. Uh, they're not the exclusive forum for international action. So I would say to you that in an ideal world, as uh, George H.W. Bush was able to do, uh, use the United Nations as a forum to rally the free people of the world to confront, for example, Iraq's invasion of Kuwait. And that was a very useful purpose. You've been able to see it also used for purposes of, of imposing sanctions against North Korea and to some effect against Iran as well. So it serves as a useful forum in which we could gather the freedom-loving people on Earth and take actions. But it cannot be the exclusive forum. For example, because of the result of China and Russia's veto power at the Security Council, there are issues that they refuse to confront, such as Syria. Uh, we, we simply cannot uh, get in United Nations action on Syria because Russia and China will block it, particularly the Russians. And so we should not just limit ourselves to the United Nations. Sometimes we must go outside of that forum and use the United States as a convening power to rally other interested people and nations to confront a real and immediate danger. I know that people ask, well, what is our national interest in Syria? And uh, as a good example, I know I get that question a lot. And the answer is, well, let's see what's happening now in Syria. Our failure to engage in an appropriate way early in that conflict to identify moderate elements of the rebels and empower them created a vacuum. And that vacuum has been filled by foreign fighters from Europe, from the Middle East, and even from the United States that have flowed to the region because that has now become the premier operational space for radical jihadists, many of whom, most of whom, aren't even Syrians. That is what happened as a result of the inability of more moderate elements to form, to get equipped, and actually occupy that space. The United Nations was never going to be a forum for us to be able to undertake that. Um, and as a result, the US should have put that coalition together ourselves. Uh, to some extent, we've done that, but not as soon and not as effectively. The other institutions that you mentioned, I mean, you're, you're looking at the IMFs now and the role that it's been able to play, for example, in stabilizing Ukraine. Certainly, the European Union has had, we're not a member of the European Union, but it has had some utility over the last few years in terms of imposing sanctions on Iran, et cetera. Um, I think this, given the recent events in Eastern Europe, is an opportunity to re reinvigorate the transatlantic alliance, the, the, the NATO alliance, and give it new purpose in the 21st century. I felt as if NATO, after the end of the Cold War, has kind of struggled to figure out what it's going to be about. I think, unfortunately, we've now found out what it may have to be about in the 21st century, and that is preserving a Europe whole and free. So uh, th th these, are, these are useful uh, uh, international forums that we can uh, engage and use our, the power of our country as forums in which to rally people, but they cannot be the exclusive forums. From time to time, they don't function. A recent example is the Organization of American States and its complete unwillingness and, 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 and incapacity to address what's happening, not just in Venezuela, but throughout Latin America as democracy is slowly but surely eroding in country after country. Ashley Nellie Davis. Good afternoon, Senator. Good afternoon. Um, how, how exactly does the U.S. balance its um, conflicting interests with uh, domestic concerns and global engagement? I actually don't think they're, I actually think they're interrelated. Uh, deeply. For example, if you look at uh, uh, the entitlement programs in our country, Social Security and Medicare are going bankrupt. Whoever the next president of the United States is will not be able to serve two full terms without confronting and saving those programs. And one of the reasons, one of the impacts that that's having on us already is our inability to address the causes of our debt is forcing us to get all of our savings from the rest of our budget. That increasingly means our defense capabilities. So what I worry about the most is not the capabilities that this president has. I worry about 10 years down the road when a future commander in chief is confronted by a challenge that we can't even imagine right now. What, what will be the tools at their disposal? Well, the research and development that's going on right now is what will lead us to having those capabilities. If we reduce our investment in those capabilities, 10 years from now we may find that we don't have the options we wish we had or that other countries have options we don't. And so that's why these domestic issues are deeply related to our issues abroad. But I would also say, for example, I asked, talked about Asia a moment ago, about 50% of the world's commerce, 50% of the world's commerce goes through the South China Sea. 
And so do you think if somehow that now fell into the total control of China, that that wouldn't have an impact on world commerce and as a result on our economy? The truth is, do you think that these markets that we now have deep inter, uh, economic ties with, if those countries are, are thrown into instability, if those countries are thrown into war, if those countries are, are, are thrown into uh, uncertainty, that that's not going to have an impact on their economy and as a result on our economy? American companies have investments abroad. We have jobs in this country that service and provide goods and services to economies abroad. If peace and prosperity erodes abroad, it will have an impact on our economy because it will have an impact on our customers, on our partners, on our trade partners. And so we, we, we really would make a mistake to divorce the two from each other. Uh, the US is a lot of things, but it is not a planet. It cannot act on, it is, it is affected by issues that are happening everywhere else. And we see that every day. All right, Ellen Scholl. Thank you, Senator, for being Thank here you. today. Um, you talked about the continued threat of tyrannical governments uh, to the international world order as well as to U.S. interests. And I was wondering, you also mentioned there were some unique challenges uh, posed in the 21st century. So I was wondering if you would comment a bit on what you think those challenges might be, both to the international world order and to U.S. interests abroad. So on, on the, uh, the, so among the unique challenges are the ability of both non-state actors and, and small economically uh, not powerful countries to have a disproportionate amount of influence over what's happening in the world. So in the 20th century and in times before that, in order to truly threaten the peace of others, you had to have a big enough economy to project power. You had to have a navy. You had to have massive equipment to be able to get abroad and, and, and take steps. That's no longer true in the 21st century. If you can acquire a nuclear weapon, you provide the ultimate in regime security, for example, North Korea. Uh, why, why is North Korea immune to a lot of international pressure? because they have a nuclear weapon, and they can threaten to blow things up and kill a lot of people if somehow actions were taken against it. So that's a reality that didn't exist in the 20th century, where only certain countries had the capability to acquire that sort of weaponry. It's become much more cost effective in the 21st century. You also have the ability, as I talked about, in cyberspace to impact other countries. You don't need to have 10 aircraft carriers. If I can wipe out uh, the, uh, your financial system electronically, or I can knock your electricity system off the grid, um, I can do tremendous damage to you, even though my, I don't have any planes capable of reaching your shores. And that's also true for non-state actors and their capability in doing that as well. I also think that non-state actors, these radical uh, groups are, that are constantly plotting terrorist attacks against our interests and that of our partners will continue to be an ongoing threat in the 21st century, except that the weapons that they use may develop into the chemical realm and potentially, God forbid, in the nuclear realm as well. I think it's just a matter of time. It is inevitable, for example, before some terrorist element figures out a way to threaten aviation through weapons that are undetectable by means that we now use to detect it. I think it's, if things continue the way they are right now, it may become inevitable that a terrorist group may be able to get their hands on radioactive material and use that to conduct a devastating attack at home here in the U.S. or somewhere abroad. Uh, these are real challenges that we didn't face in the 20th century. Our enemies then wore uniforms, and we knew where their bases were. This is a little different. These are real challenges that we confront, and ones that I think we're going to continue to confront in the 21st century. And the uh, final student question from Mark Gibelli. Uh Senator, you alluded to in your discussion the, the, the strong relationship between uh, economic prosperity and security, yet the global commons uh, seems to be increasingly under threat, rising tensions over thawing Arctic sea lanes, as well as sustained piracy and the South China Sea. What's your assessment of the security of the global commons, and how can we continue to ensure that? Well, I think what's important to remember is that much of what you describe as the global commons, you know, the freedom of navigation in the seas, the ability to, I mean, again, we got to go back in history a little bit and not take that for granted. It really wasn't so long ago in human history where you really couldn't go anywhere you wanted. I mean, there were parts of the world and, and areas in the ocean that were controlled by either non-state actors or by governments that you had to pay tribute to if you wanted to, tri to commerce through there. Since the end of World War II, that has not been the case. One of the things that we strongly committed to in the international order, order is freedom of navigation. And while it's great that we've had treaties to ensure that, the number one guarantor of that has been the United States Navy. That's why the U.S. Navy fights pirates off the Horn of Africa. That's why the U.S. Navy has a presence in Asia and in the Caribbean and in the Atlantic and everywhere else. Uh, and that's had traumatic impact, the ability to, to, to send goods abroad safely without it being hijacked or torpedoed has made a tremendous impact on, on global prosperity. And, and these things, of course, now, and the, these are all governed by a certain set of rules that in the 21st century, governments like China no longer want to play by. Uh, 
the Chinese attitude towards that is those are rules you guys wrote 100 years ago or 50 years ago, and we don't, we don't feel like we need to abide by them. We believe in a new set of rules. So they produce a map like the nine dash line, which basically says the entire South China Sea belongs to them. And they don't intend to invade. They, don't, they, they intend to basically continue to build their military capability vis-a-vis -vis our willingness and our capability to the point where nations in the region just realize, look, if we are ever attacked, the US can't or won't come to our defense because it's not worth it to them. As a commentator once said, we're not going to go to war over a bunch of rocks talking about the Scarborough Shoal. And at that point, these countries now have to enter into some sort of agreement and acquiesce to the way China views the world. And I think it's important to be wise about this. The Chinese view the last 100 years as an aberration. They view themselves clearly as a global power, but particularly a regional power, where all these other nations pay tribute to greater China. All these other nations were under the dominion of China and subservient to China's interests. That's what they view as the normal order of things, and that the last 100 years, what they call a century of humiliation, was just an aberration. And if you go to Asia, the Japanese, the Koreans, and others are very clear about the direction China is headed. Unlike the Russians, I don't think the Chinese are going to be invading Japan or Korea anytime soon. But I do think that they want to continue to grow their capabilities, especially their anti-axis capabilities, until they reach the point over the next two decades where these countries understand that the US security assurances are just words, that we're incapable or unwilling to enforce them. And at that point, they're going to have to figure out an arrangement with the Chinese that will be very pro-Chinese. Uh, and, and, so, and, and I worry about the impact that will have on global trade and, and opportunity in the, in the decades to come. Well, and uh, Mark, I didn't even tell the senator that you're actually a member of the uh, ROTC program, uh, the Navy ROTC program here at UT. So uh, thanks for your kind words yeah, for the Seventh Fleet. The so the, that's the right. Global okay. Commons open. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, um, you know, as we're wrapping up, Senator, I'd just like to observe. We talked about some very serious issues today: weapons of mass destruction, terrorism, uh, the rise of China, uh, continuing Russian revanchism and aggression. And I think we'd all agree here those are very serious issues. But there's one issue more serious than all of those for us here at Texas. I think for some like you from Florida, and that's college football. And I'd just like to say thank you very much for uh, what Flor the role Florida played in training up Charlie Strong, our new head coach. And I think um, George, we'd like to come up here the, along the way. It'll yeah. stop in Louisville. On the way. And uh, George, we'd like to help me present a special <laughs> gift we've got for Senator Rubio here. I hope you wear Bradley. Jersey. That's right. So, All right. Okay. and here we go. So, okay. All right. So. All right. Hook them. So, anyway, we'd love to see you wearing this on the Senate floor. Thank you yeah, so much. Yeah. Senator. This is fantastic. <laughs> so that's right. So, thank anyway, you. So, thanks, thanks for having me. Sure, thank you.